Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Welcome to another episode of The Boardroom. As always, we're live this morning, and we'd love to involve you in our conversation today. So please do add your questions and your comments below, and we will try to put them to our interviewees right here, right now. If you don't manage to catch this live, this will be streamed back on who'swho.mt, Malta's leading business portal. Now, anxiety is quite high at the moment for a variety of reasons, especially in the business community, um, as people look to the next few months and wonder what things are going to be like. There are, of course, many major things happening at the moment, aside from coronavirus, other worries like uh, Brexit and, of course, the upcoming American election. People wondering the impact that that's going to have um, even here in Malta. And to help me discover a little bit about that, to have a conversation about whether Malta will be affected, uh, whether the result goes one way or another. I'd love to welcome my three guests today. They are George Vital Zamit, who is resident academic at the Department of Public Policy at the University of Malta. We also have Dr. Valentina Kassar, who is a lecturer in international relations at the University of Malta. And finally, we have Michael Kamaleri Kamski, who is general manager at the Western Dragonara Resort. Thank you so much for being with me. Very good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us. So we're going to be talking today about a potentially contentious issue, okay? Something that is causing anxiety on both sides of the pond, because this is one of the most talked about, one of the most highly anticipated elections um, in a generation, if not more. And I'd love to be getting your insight into that. Michael, I'd like to come to you first, just for your, for your input on why is this such a big deal, this American election? I mean... Um... It's, it's, it's big because people feel um, an investment in the election result because the US is one of the largest superpowers in the world and plays a major role in not only the world's economy, but also a number of agreements, international treaties, etc. Absolutely. And um, George, just to follow on from that, um, why do you think it's causing anxiety? Why is this something that, you know, over here in Europe we, we care about? Well, it's causing anxiety because Trump is one of those leaders that you love or hate. And divisive leaders always have this effect. Um, some people would love to have them back, re-elected, and stay and lead the show forever. And the people who despise them would love to see them away. And that's, that's typical Trump. In Europe, that seems to be the prevailing sentiment, that Trump is not the ideal U.S. partner that we would like to have. But uh, in his uh, home territory, that's pretty 50-50. So we'll get to see whether um, we'll get four more years of um, uh, Trump uh, style of politics and content and, or whether we'll have a new page. Okay, very interesting there, George and Valentina. To come to you again with that, obviously you're a you're an expert in relations when it comes to U.S., Russia, etc., international understanding. What are your thoughts on this election, and and why again we're feeling it so heavily here in Europe? And I think the U.S. presidential elections are always closely watched and always gather a lot of attention, and they're almost like a you know like a, a premier sporting event, you know, for for the rest of the world, especially when it comes to politics and elections. Um, it's a very complicated election process. It's a very different and unique type of electoral process. So that as well, I think, attracts uh, a lot of curiosity in the way the result is formulated. I think we all feel invested in the, in the election and in the results of the election because whether we like it or not, or whether the United States likes it or not, I would say the US is a country that is very heavily invested in the rest of the world. And it is, as Michael already commented, one of the leading superpowers that has a very big impact on uh, the rest of the international community, whether it's at a political level, a military level, economic, and even at a cultural level. There's that soft power element, which makes us all feel like we, we know the United States on a daily basis, we follow the news on a daily basis because it's given so much media coverage. And that, fam that familiarity, I would say, with the the day-to-day the -day life within the United States and the politics of the United States and the cultural output that it has makes us, it, that familiarity breeds a broader interest, I would say, in the general election and the results much more than it would in, in other countries, I would say, within the rest of the world. 
certainly. And Valentina, staying with you, do you think it's warranted that we feel this level of anxiety, that we feel this level of investment? Do you think that um, uh, we, we deserve to feel this way or should we just kind of get on with it? I think, I mean, as you mentioned at the beginning, there is a level of anxiety anyway at the moment because of the, the pandemic and, and the economic uncertainties and the health uncertainties and the mental uncertainties that it creates. As George commented, Trump is, is a politician that is contentious. You either love him or hate him. And I think many people um, find it difficult to sort of filter through his rhetoric and his tweets to look at the substantive policy, policy issues, which for the most part have been more mainstream Republican than we, we recognize them to be, I would say. Um, I think in the United States, we always see fluctuations between administrations and especially between political parties. There is sort of, there are elements of change, but then there is a lot of continuity, especially when it comes to foreign policy, I would say, and the external policies that, that they project. I think what is very different about Trump is the tone and the style with which he projects um, certain, certain policy positions and objectives. So I think on the, on the one hand, I think we can afford to be a little bit more, um, uh, sort of a little bit calmer about the outcome of the election, whichever way it goes. At the same time, he does have a very sort of brash rhetoric and he has proved that he is, he is more willing to act more abruptly and aggressively as well on certain policy issues. So when we look at his, his policy towards you know, the World Trade Organization or the World Health Organization or, or the Iran deal or climate change. So, so there is a much faster paced change that I think he, he is trying to bring about in his, um, in, in his policies and, his, and the positions that he's taking on the world stage. Okay, thank you, Valentina. I know that, you know, from speaking to colleagues and friends, uh, the last four years have been somewhat anxious for a lot of us. I know I certainly got used to waking up in the middle of the night, checking my phone and seeing a, a news alert for something that's happened again on the other side of the world. Michael, I'll come to you for, for your thoughts on that. I mean, regardless of the result, what do you hope will happen and change after this election? Well, if we look at history since 1932, an incumbent U.S. president has never failed to win re-election unless a recession has occurred during the time in office. Regardless of the result, I hope to see a more prosperous and united America than the one we are currently seeing. Um, yes, COVID could be um, translated by the Americans as not the fault of the president, so it might not be considered um, like a recession, as previous, uh, uh, we we'll look at it historically, um, and therefore I think there still stands a chance that he might bridge this gap that is, is still uh, still stands between himself and uh, Joe Biden. And so, how does that make you feel, Michael? How does that make you? You know, what 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 thoughts does that bring to mind? Well, as, as Valentina um, described very, very well, I mean, uh, he's very uh, aggressive in his, in his approach and uh, you either like him or, or you hate him, you know, so, uh, but he, he, he doesn't come across, at, at least on the, on the international uh, arena, as uh, the right president for the United States, which is a superpower, uh, currently for, for the world. Thank you, Michael. And George, I'll come to you now again for your for your hopes about what's going to happen in the next few weeks. Um, feel free to share again any predictions that you might have and, and also, um, again, what, what you hope will be the result of, of this new phase. Well, my hopes are, are um, quite a few. First of all, I'd like to see um, uh, a United States that uh, finally gets over this what i think has 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 arisen to prominently in the past few years Th there's a social rapture that has taken a racist tone and we have seen this with 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 the murder of um, uh, george floyd uh, breonna taylor and these were citizens that you know wouldn't have been classified as criminals in the normal sense there was normal citizens that were killed by by the police and it's it has happened 
many a time in the United States. And what we've seen again, um, those who are my age and remember the uh, LA riots um, uh, 30 years ago, uh, we, we saw that back. And my thinking is that Trump hasn't done enough to address this rupture. Um, it's not fair definitely to blame this on him. The United States in various aspects is a dysfunctional country um, for various for various reasons. But uh, uh, in this sense, I, I, I hope to see a president that brings back the country together. That has not happened. Now, Trump, as we say, is, is very unpredictable. And uh, in the international scene, especially in diplomacy, unpredictability is an asset, not a weakness. Now, I might be here going against um, the grain, perhaps. Um, Trump, given his unpredictability, has this unique feature where you know he's coming to the table and you don't know what, what his mindset is. So he, for example, has managed to sit down with a North Korean leader, actually shake hands and visit uh, North Korean um, uh, territory, um, unlike any other one in history. That is unprecedented. Um, he, he wasn't he wasn't actually in Pyongyang, but you know that that was quite a feat when they crossed the border between um, the North and South Korea. So no one would probably have thought that would have happened because just a few weeks before, Trump was you know calling um, um, Kim Jong Un you know a madman, rocket man, and, and so basically there's this unpredictability, which in diplomacy could could work could work wonders. Uh, but four more years of Trump, I, I, um, um, my concern is that, for example, when it comes to, 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 to climate change, um, mm -hmm. they will be neglected again. We'll keep in mind that the Paris Accords, which was the first thing that he did as soon as he became president, that withdrawal will come into effect very soon. And, and he, that, he did that immediately. So here you have the biggest polluter on Earth, the United States and absconding from its responsibilities. So th that's that's what concerns me. Not to mention that there are many other issues, such as you know the immigration from the South, um, uh, the United States finally being again a world leader on a number of matters, uh, Europe uh, feeling that you have a world partner. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case at the moment. So my hope is, Joe, that whoever takes the seat will take leadership for, um, um, you know, the right reasons, uh, back again to the table. Thank you, George. And, and yes, Valentina, with, with that in mind, um, if we had to look today at what a Trump victory could mean for the rest of the world, um, uh, and perhaps even Malta specifically, versus what a, Vi a Biden victory could mean for the rest of the world, and then Malta specifically, what would be your thoughts? I mean, I think, first of all, we'd have to to sort of touch a little bit on what we were talking about earlier. I think what is important is that there is a clear result. That is, that there is results that are, are clear results that are available sooner rather than later. And that is a result that is not contested um, by, by either candidate. Because obviously with the mail-in systems that are being utilized, especially because of, of the pandemic, that is creating a lot of concerns and questions over whether um, the result will be actually reliably available um, you know, within, within a couple of hours or whether it will take longer to be, to be counted and finalized. I think if we had to think about what would you know, a Trump victory mean for, for the rest of the world or, or, a, or a Biden victory, I think as George already alluded to, I think you know, with the Trump administration, what we've seen is a presidency that has been expressing certain reservations and, and implementing this retreat from the international community that had already been started and had already been underway under previous administrations before him. You, know, you saw the Obama administration, which was already starting to retreat and, and lead from behind, was already starting to express reservations over um, the extent to which um, the United States was footing the bill within the international system, especially with, for example, organizations like NATO, World Health Organization, and other UN um, branches. Um, you know, Trump, was elected on a ticket of make America great again. And I think he's still, you know, pushing that agenda within his campaign. And, you know, that is accentuating and amplifying that. Um, and it's also accelerating 
um, the sense of retreat and withdrawal. And as George said, there is an element of, of unpredictability. In a second term of office, presidents tend to be a little bit more pragmatic once they're re-elected because they don't need to concern themselves with their own personal re-election, though they obviously keep an eye on the fact that their party um, is contesting subsequent elections. So we might see a, um, a more pragmatic President Trump if he's re-elected within foreign policy issues. We might see a bolder um, President Trump on foreign policy issues. But as George said, you know, there is that element of unpredictability. Um, I think if Biden were elected, what we'd see is um, a foreign policy that is more similar to what we saw during the Obama years. He was his vice president. As you know, many of his foreign policy advisors are people who are very heavily involved within the Obama administration. So I think we will see a continuity in that respect, this idea of the United States um, still continuing to maybe not withdraw, but still continuing a more moderate position within the international community. I think they will still emphasize a notion of leading from behind, but more engaged. So I think we will see you know, climate change issues, health issues, world trade issues being, um, being, being readjusted, if you will. Um, and the notion, I think if we have to look at it from a European perspective, the concern has been that the United States has not um, been very keen on maintaining the international liberal framework mm -hmm. and multilateral framework that it was so key in creating, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. after the end of the Second World War. And a lot of that has been left to the hands of the Europeans, I think, over the past couple of years. So I think what we would see under Biden would be more of that engagement. He's already started to talk, to talk about creating a summit for democracies and, and rebuilding that networking within the international system. Okay. Well, I certainly know where I sit on, uh, on that one. And um, uh, Michael, I'll, I'll come to you now again. Obviously, you're in the business community, um, uh, an international brand um, as part of a, a global operation. What would be your thoughts on um, uh, how a Trump victory would continue to affect the rest of the world and then the, the, the Biden victory instead of it? Well, uh, I think uh, a Biden vi victory most likely would be reversing um, many positions that Trump has taken um, of, over the past uh, four years. And uh, the values of American public um, also um, will change. It will mean more, most likely more taxes um, in the US. However, on the other hand, um, the Democratic Party said that they will be injecting seven to eight trillion into the economy, especially in infrastructure. On an international scale, it may boost collective action on international challenges such as climate change and uh, the novel coronavirus pandemic. Nevertheless, it is important to keep in mind that it is not a um, magical return the United States to a, an era of unquestioned American primacy. Uh, on the other hand, a Trump victory uh, looks unlikely, although it looks unlikely, we shouldn't rule him out as yet. If one recalls in 2016 elections, Trump was in a similar position that he is currently in at the moment. However, the exposure of Hillary Clinton's scandal uh, was enough for voters to lean in the direction of her opposition. Nevertheless, a Trump victory would give us more of the same uh, as we have experienced to date, if not more dramatic being his last term in office. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Michael. And, and George, I'll come back to you now for sort of your thoughts on um, uh, the current administration and international relations and trade. I mean, currently, would you say, how do you think things look differently under Trump than they did four years ago under Obama? Well, uh, to, to, I think Trump should be given at least um, uh, the benefit of, of of being a president that had this 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 pandemic, and that's that's not unlike any other leader in the world. The the problem with Trump was his attitude, his bullish attitude at the beginning, actually denying it, and I would say his reckless behavior to the day till yesterday. So till yesterday, Trump was actually. Um, posting on Facebook, it's him or his advisors. I think sometimes it's actually him because you can see the content, um, uh, the content and the way he he delivers the message. It must be him sometimes, where he's actually comparing his arrival at a rally 
with a helicopter and you have you know swarms uh, of people gathering without a mask and he's mocking biden actually for being at a you know a, 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 at a mini rally with very few people who are keeping their distance so this is the president of the united states actually sending the wrong message and uh, let's keep in mind that we have now almost a quarter of a million people that have actually died as a result of covid in the united states this year alone in a few months so that has been reckless um, to 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 every extent. But you, you you're referring to business here, Joe, and 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 the business world and the business community is usually very attracted to a Republican administration, and the reason is very simple: um, the idea that um, uh, the less things are regulated, the better. So the idea that less fair capitalism needs less regulations, not more, needs less of the state and not more. And that is usually a Republican idea. What that creates, Joe, is um, uh, a bigger gap when it comes to wealth. So the, the difference between the haves and the have-nots has actually increased in the United States. The number of people that have lost their private insurance, medical insurance, has gone up to 8 million uh, and 8 million more. So uh, um, this, this, this is what usually happens in a conservative administration. Again, Trump is not new. Um, this, this was the famous Reaganomics um, uh, philosophy. So we, we would probably see that a business community, keep in mind that he reduced taxes for the super rich. Keep in mind that Jeff Bezos, the, the now the richest person on earth, hasn't paid a dime in taxes the past year. So this is what the business community wants in the United States. But that's, that's, that's a fraction of the population. Now there is an economic thinking behind that, that these people, by saving in their taxes, would use that money to invest in their businesses, which would mean more jobs. Um, so that's, that's the rationale behind it. That's the philosophy behind it. What has happened now was, is not actually that. So there have been thousands of jobs that have been lost due to COVID. And that in no way is Trump's fault. Trump's fault is actually um, in, in, in you know, providing um, uh, a sense of comfort uh, by the people that things are going to change. I, I need to say this because Michael actually referred to this in, in his opening um, um, uh, piece. Uh, Jimmy Carter and George Bush Sr. failed to get re-elected. Now, Carter was in a recession, so he's right there. George Bush, probably not, although the beginnings were there. But George Bush had a very, very successful presidency, probably one of the most successful presidents ever. But he failed to re-elect it. Because on the other side, someone came, and it was Bill Clinton, and, you know, and his team had coined the phrase that it's the economy stupid. So the economy again, Joe, you're right, this will play a very important role. And I think we have just a few more days and um, people will definitely look at their pockets and and now thousands have already voted so we need we need to say this thousands have already voted and to an extent the result part of it is already cooked um, we'll see in the next few days whether things can change the game i have already seen something yesterday that might be a game changer what happened in france the other day mm -hmm. although it happened in france it happened in europe uh, Trump has already, you know, played the card, you know, and 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 this might be, this may play to his advantage. Let's keep in mind something which you didn't mention. Um, uh, the leader of ISIS was actually, you know, eliminated during the Trump administration. So that's that's a feather in his cap, which he might be willing to play again in the next two three days. Okay. Thank you, George. Lots of insight there, and lots of lots of things that we might not have thought about. Actually, that is a, that is a one to certainly be thinking about. Um, and Valentina, if I had to come to you with the question about, you know, what have been the negative um, elements that we've seen to international relations under the Trump administration, and have there been any positives? I mean, as we were talking about earlier, you know, the Trump administration has withdrawn from and retreated the United States from several initiatives that, you know, the international community did not, I would say, react so favorably to things like, you know, climate change, the Iran deal, um, and so on. I think he has been very assertive, as we know, with regards to trade and being more assertive with um, not only competitors like, like China, which I would say is, is a policy that was probably 
well received within the United States, um, but also more assertive with regards to the trade relationship with the EU, um, and more as well as more assertive with, with regards to defense spending. And I think what that has done is has made the EU start to look more closely at being more strategically autonomous, uh, autonomous, excuse me, and independent. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. That raises the profile of the European Union and of the European uh, states, in not just in their um, in their own right, but even in terms of their mutual relationship with the United States, which is one that is not going to go away anytime soon. Um, another issue which got, got, uh, attracted a lot of, of attention was the policies with, with regards to the Middle East. Um, even if we look at, for example, the, the Middle East peace plan that um, he launched, um, that obviously got a lot of criticism because of the fact that it was a peace plan that was signed on by, by the, the Israelis and not the Palestinians. So that has been very contentious. But this is an area where most presidents try to put their stamp on, but on a, on a particularly successful. Um, but we also have seen some more positives within the Middle East. So looking at, let's say, the Israeli relationship with the UAE and Bahrain becoming more normalized, which has a lot to do with the Trump administration. Um, many of his advocates will say the fact that Trump has not increased or engaged in new wars within the Middle East has been a positive. Um, you know, so so there are aspects which have been concerning, but also aspects which have been more muted, I would say, in his in his projection of foreign policy. Okay, thank you, Valentina. And uh, Michael, I'll come to you now, just for your thoughts on, on going forward again, in, a, in, in the business perspective, um, particularly, again, you are part of, a, of an international brand. Do you do you see things being very different um, between one outcome and another, especially when it comes to how this could affect um, American brands in Malta? Well, personally, I think that the current administration has created many difficulties for international trades when it comes to the US. However, this should improve with a Biden victory, as the chances are that there will be a more open international relations and trade with the rest of the world. Um, many of the American trade and international relations have significantly weakened under the current administration. A prime example of this is the relations with China, um, one of the world's economic superpowers. The two have locked in, in bitter trade battles and, and this has seen the US impose tariffs of billions of dollars worth with one another. So. Uh, it's, it's, that's that's what I personally think. However, okay. you mentioned Malta, right? Whether it would have been mm -hmm. done. Um, in Malta, we do have. When I I can I can speak about the uh, travel travel business. We do uh, have regular conferences coming from the United States, and that um, is also very very good business for Malta because. And some global brand companies do organize conferences in Malta on a regular basis. So uh, that could also uh, be affected negatively or positively, depending on how the economy of the United States um, will, will uh, progress. Okay, thank you. Well, everyone, as we sort of start to wrap up our conversation today, I would just love to get a bit of insight from each of you. First of all, Feel free to make a prediction. What do you think is going to happen on Tuesday, if you can? And then finally, what would be your future hope uh, for the American um, uh, relations as we continue to see them develop between um, us here in Malta and Europe in general? Michael, I'll come to you first. Um, the, 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 the polls are, are, are favoring uh, Joe Biden, as we all know. However, I wouldn't be surprised um, in the last few days, as George quite uh, rightly um, mentioned, that uh, Trump might come up with some last minute um, action, which can really um, get him at par with Joe Biden. And if that is the case, that would be not good news because um, it can 
stall the situation. Um, the election result can go up to the Supreme Court. It can take six months and the whole thing will stall. And if the, if the United States stalls, the whole world will stall with them. Yeah, but, agreed. Uh, most likely, I, I, I have a tendency that Trump will, will finally make it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Valentina, what would be your prediction and your hope? I mean, in terms of prediction, I am erring on the side of caution. I'm not overly optimistic that the polls got it right this time as well. You know, I think we might still see, I think even though a lot of effort was made to correct the polling and data gathering systems um, to be a bit more fine tuned. Um, and there is a wider margin and a different type of margin that we're seeing between Biden and Trump that there was between Hillary Clinton and Trump. I still think that it's not a result that can be taken for granted in his favor because it, it's a result that boils down to a couple of states at the end of the day. Um, and these are the, the states that will determine the outcome of the election results. So, you know, the national polls don't say much about what, what the outcome ends up being. Um, I think in terms of, of foreign policy, I would be optimistic that there would be perhaps a more sort of balanced approach if, um, even if there was a Trump re-election. I think in terms of relations with Malta, I think we are lucky that we have always enjoyed consistent and very steady bilateral relations with the United States, irrespective of who was in government, whether that's in Malta or, or in the United States. So, so I am sort of cautiously optimistic about the bilateral relationship. But obviously, as Michael mentioned, the economic uncertainty within the United States has a ripple effect over the whole entire, entire international economy. I think what I, I am look, looking forward to is uh, sort of a, a, one less thing to be anxious about, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, and perhaps, um, you know, less politicized and less um, heightened and amplified political rhetoric coming out of the United States. I think there is a strong need across the globe and especially within the US for more tolerance, whether it's at an economic level, whether it's at a humane level with regards to the way the, the pandemic and healthcare issues are approached. There is a need for more tolerance, especially at a race level, as George was talking about. And, and more tolerance across the political divide and hope, hopefully cooler heads will prevail and both from the administration and the White House and even within Congress, there will be more efforts to create um, more resilient mechanisms for the economy and, and the health of the country. Thank you, Valentina. And finally, George, what would be your prediction and what would be your hope? Well, let me tell you, I gave my well, my, my prediction uh, four years ago, and then I had to, you know, eat humble pie. Um, but I mean, as, 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 as my friends here are saying, I mean, if you took any any forecast at the moment, they are all tilted towards um, Joe Biden. But uh, history is a lesson. So one needs to be careful with that. And if, if Biden does actually get the upper end, what we hope that it's it's not a way for it in margin. I actually saw a forecast yesterday where the electoral college, the difference would be, you know, just a few seats. That could be catastrophic for reasons that Valentina alluded to. Um, it, 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 he might not concede. If Trump doesn't concede, then it goes the legal way, and we might have a rehash of the Gore-Bush uh, campaign election in, in 2000. That could be catastrophic. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, um, well, what I think, I actually think that Trump might actually clinch um, a second election because he is a very good campaigner. Um, and, and there are so many faults of the Electoral College, one of them being that it has made this so predictable in the sense um, the, the leaders don't campaign in the states that are actually, you know, um, uh, pretty well established. So I'll give you an example. No one has gone to California and to New York Biden and Trump have never been to California or New York. Why? And this is about 50 million people we're talking about. Because we know that both are democratic states and they will not be changed. Uh, but this, this throws the ball on the way the campaign is conducted. The campaign is conducted on the swing states. That's where the leaders will be going and visiting the, the next two months, the next two days, sorry. And which means you're leaving big chunks of American territory literally out of the question. 
no one goes to Wyoming, no one goes to Montana, um, and basic, because they have only two or three electoral seats. So um, this this is a pity. So if if but on the other hand, if Biden wins, I actually think it will be a short presidency. I know this might not sound very nice to say, um, and Trump has been doing this. Uh, Biden doesn't seem very well. He's seventy seven. He has had these few instances where you know he he was forgetful, and um, which would mean we will have a commander in chief who is a female. So if if you need to look at the positive side of that. If something happens to Joe Biden again, I mean, it's not very reassuring that, you know, the United States um, will be represented either by um, uh, a 77 year old or a 75 year old. Nothing wrong with being, you know, um, of a certain age, but it, 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 it's, it's a bit against what we have right now. You know, Canada has a, a young prime minister. Europe has a number of young prime ministers. So we'll see, Joe. Um, my hope, and this is where I will... Um, uh, wrap up. My hope is to see uh, a, a White House uh, and public office which is given back its dignity, its decor. I'm a bit fed up of seeing the White House run like a soap opera. Um, that has been the case for the past four years. We have had, you know, a commander in chief who tweets 30, 40 times a day. And uh, I, I wish to see again, you know, a leader that is. Um, more attuned to lead a nation rather than a reality show. That is my hope. <clears throat> yes, well, that's certainly my hope as well, George. And um, uh, you haven't done very much to solve my anxiety today. But again, like all of you, we're hoping for dignity, decorum, and a positive future for the United States and for all of us. So thank you so much to my guests for being with me today, George, Valentina, and Michael. It's been a pleasure to hear your views. And thank you to everyone at home. I know that you know it's going to be a tumultuous few days. We don't know what's going to happen, but we just have to wait and see. Thank you for being with me on the boardroom. A pleasure as always. I look forward to seeing you next time.